All right, welcome everyone back to another episode of Sierra School Prep Academy podcast. I'm your host, Jenny Fennell, and today we are going to discuss why you do not need to be a straight-A student to be successful in CRNA school. So as most of you probably know, CRNA school is really hard. It's really challenging. And many of you may be thinking that you need to be a straight-A student or close to a straight-A student to really truly find success in a CRNA program. But that really is not necessarily true. And I wanted to try to debunk this myth and the reasons around that. And I also want to kind of break down what these schools are really looking for and why they are looking for these things, um, because many of them understand that grades do not mean everything. So um, first, I want to let you know that no matter whether you have a 4.0 in your past or a 3.0 in your past, CRNA school will be incredibly difficult, even for someone who has a historically good academic track record. Things that are really crucial to be a successful in CRNA school are things like study or effective study techniques, time management, grit and growth mindset. Because let's just put it in perspective. If you're a straight A student, you have always received straight A's, you get into CRNA school and you have a test where you get a C. That's, that might rattle you to the point of, who am I? I have, I'm, a, I'm a straight A student, how can I let this happen? Who am I? Am I not really as smart as I thought I was? You're slipping into a fixed mindset versus the student who maybe historically is used to not always getting good grades and is more accustomed to relying on some grit to keep pushing through the difficult times and saying, yes, no, not yet, I will improve. How can I change my strategy? So sometimes even really um, students who have 4.0s, sometimes they've never been challenged to the point where if they don't do well, they don't know how to handle that. They don't know how to cope with that. They actually have an identity with being smart. So when they don't succeed, it kind of rattles them at their core. Um, and it's okay. This is a natural human thing. And I really think this starts from a very young age in your childhood with what your experience is in school. And it doesn't mean that you can't be a 4.0 student and be gritty. So please do not interpret it that way. There are plenty of 4.0 students who truly are 4.0 students because they are gritty. Um, but there's also a, a batch that maybe hasn't realized that, you know, they don't have effective study techniques. And when they're challenged in a way they've never been challenged, they may not be as successful as they have in the past. And they, then they don't understand why. And they kind of feel lost and helpless and scared. And so I want to empower you to know that you can do it. You will do it. Um, you have to pull back on that strength that you know is within you to keep going forward, to get gritty, to adapt the growth mindset. And I have a lecture on that or a podcast episode on that. So if you have not listened to that episode, I highly encourage you to go through the archives and find it. So let's get back into how grades are not everything. You know, yes, grades are important and many schools use this as a benchmark to how well you can perform academically in their program. Um, that is also why they break down your GPA into different areas, such as the last 60 credits, last 20 credits, your core science GPA, your nursing GPA. Um, they all will do it a little bit differently, but for the most part, one thing that's always consistent is they look at your science grades. And the reason why they look at your science grades is because the CRNA curriculum is very, very heavy in your in the science in the science courses. So if you have a lower GPA, say a 3.0 in your sciences, most schools require a benchmark of at least 80% or higher, some are 87% to pass their core anesthesia curriculum. So if they have a student who historically shows that they can't perform at that level, they're they see that as kind of a red flag that maybe you wouldn't be able to withstand a graduate level curriculum that's going to be very challenging. So yes, you can overcome this. And many of you are like, but Jenny, you know, I wasn't mature when I took these classes. I was 18 years old. 100%. I feel you. I remember being there too. My first year in college, I got rocked as well. I, 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 for the first time, I was challenged in a way that high school did not challenge me and I didn't know how to study effectively. Um, so I, understand. Um, the big thing though is what have you done? What have you done to overcome that? Did you accept it and just kept going, um, getting C's and getting B's and not trying to figure out different strategies to get the A's? Um, so if you did not start doing that early on, I challenge you to do it now um, to look for ways to improve your GPA by taking graduate level courses and figuring out your strategy so you can get an A in advanced pathophysiology or pharmacology. 
go back and take an organic chemistry. So many um, colleges of nursing these days, unfortunately, don't require some courses that are actually required for CRNA school, like organic chemistry. Um, some schools don't even require chemistry at all. Some schools require math, and not all nursing colleges require math anymore. Um, so make sure you're researching this very early on so you can plan for that and you don't have to wait till you want to apply to school and realize you need these extra courses. Um, but back to GPA, you know, the average overall GPA for CRNA school is a 3.5. That's both overall and science. However, depending on your program, it could be different. Some programs, the average science GPA GPA is a 3.7. Some programs, a 3.4. As you can see, that's a pretty big range. A 3.4 is the average versus a 3.7 is the average. So if you understand this, if you know this prior to picking your school, you can maybe gauge your likeliness of being considered as an applicant when applying to that program. If a program has a 3.7 average GPA in their class that they accept and you have a barely a 3.2, you know, you're probably going to struggle a lot more to gain an interview at that program than a school that has an average GPA of a 3.4. So keep that in mind. Um, so, yes, do your research. You need to make sure you're understanding this before you even get to your application cycle. Um, and, and then the reason why this is, you guys, is just in my time talking with program directors, um, some schools place a heavier weight on GPA than others. Um, some will not accept retaking courses, for example. Some, some of you maybe have a C um, in a class, and so you're like, well, I'll retake it, and I got an A. Some programs will not consider that retaking course. Other programs will take that retaking course and eliminate your old, your lesser grade, your C, while other programs will average the two. So as you can see, it's very different, and it just depends on how your program handles that um, and as far as what your actual course science GPA is going to be once they finish their calculations. So these are things that you should be researching prior if you're the kind of student who maybe needs to retake a course. Kind of figure out how, how your school handles that. What are they going to do? Or if you retake a course, how are they going to calculate that into your GPA? Or is it not even worth applying there because maybe they're not going to consider your retake and maybe your GPA will never be high enough to meet their minimum standard to even get an interview? Well, then you move on. You go to a different school, right? So this is why this is really helpful in the beginning because it allows you to use your time and energy wisely when going to CRNA school or applying to CRNA school. So I do and challenge you to break down your GPA. You need to understand it, not just your overall. So many students don't understand why they don't get an interview, but when you look at their, their, their GPA, when you break it down, it's usually something there that could potentially be hindering them. However, GPA is not everything. There are a lot of other things that go into your application other than your GPA. And so sure, a 4.0 student may be more likely to get an interview, but not if they miss other bullet points of their, of their um, application. You know, if they lack leadership roles, if they have never job shadowed, if they um, didn't meet the GRE minimum, if they didn't meet the CCRN minimum, you know, if they had a bad reference, a re letter of reference, that'd be a huge red flag. Even if you're a 4.0 student, if you got a really bad letter of recommendation from someone saying, I do not recommend this candidate, that's a pretty big red flag that you don't have that emotional intelligence piece to pick someone who would give you a good reference, right? Um, so there are other factors that go into how and when and if you get an interview for a CRNA program. But yes, GPA is a big factor in that. But let's not forget about other things such as leadership roles, job shadowing. I know a lot of programs don't require job shadowing. They just recommend it. And I understand this last few years has been incredibly hard for you to get a shadowing experience. But I please, please try. You have to give it your best effort to try. Um, I've had programs, you know, tell me that, you know, even if it's not required, if they have an applicant who doesn't do this step, it kind of signals to them that maybe they're not as, a, as serious of a candidate or they don't want it as much as someone who has several shadowing experiences. So try your best to get these shadowing experiences. And also over the last few years, you guys, we've recognized how challenging this has been. And so inside Sierra School Prep Academy, we have a virtual shadowing experience that is included with your membership. It's a three hour experience where I walk you through very thorough three hours, walk you through a day in the life of a CRNA. I even do a, a screen share and share um, a machine checkout on Dreger's website. So that's, that's something you can take to your school and say, I've tried, I've reached out to all the 
uh, hospitals and facilities around my city. I haven't been able to get a shadowing experience, but I have this virtual experience with Syrian School Prep Academy. Will you accept this as an experience so I can continue my application with your program? Many of them will accept that. We also have a virtual simulation experience where we have seven SRNAs who act out a general OR case in a real anesthesia simulation lab. Um, along with Richard Wilson, CSBA's expert contributor, who then walks you through the different aspects of a general anesthetic. This is an addition, so this is not part of the membership, but you can purchase this as an addition to your membership. And if you sign up for CSBA, you can purchase this for just $69, but otherwise you can purchase this for $89. And again, this is something that you can show to your programs and show them that you're taking initiative to learn about a day in the life of a CRNA. And so when you're applying to CRNA school, you can't just say, well, I don't have a shadow experience. I've never seen the OR. I've never talked to a CRNA. This will give you a foundation to go on, especially when they ask you, why do you want to become a CRNA? And you're like, well, you know, and all you have to go by is what you write on Google. I encourage you to hear it firsthand from real practicing CRNAs such as myself and Richard Wilson. Um, so you have a good way to answer that question. Um, so that's enough on the shadowing experience. But again, don't stop trying. Um, you can look at, you know, ketamine clinics, so pain clinics, ophthalmology clinics, endoscopy clinics, dental clinics, med spas employ CRNAs, fertility clinics employ CRNAs. There are a lot of places CRNAs work other than just hospitals. And if you get a shadowing experience, regardless of whether it's at a hospital or a fertility clinic, as long as you get a chance to speak with a CRNA and get that shadowing experience, that's going to be great. So don't forget about those extra options as well. All right. So other things such as wrong ICU experience, sometimes people kind of forget that, you know, if they say on an individual basis, that's not necessarily putting your best foot forward. That's kind of like them saying, well, we don't prefer it, but if that's all you have, then we'll consider it as long as you blow us out of the water with everything else in your application. Is that really what you want to do? I personally, considering how competitive these programs are, that isn't and wouldn't shouldn't be your first choice is to have an individual basis experience. Now, if it's too late, if you're already in the midst of your application and you figure this out at that moment and you're like, oh, what do I do? I really want to apply. Then by all means, apply. You know, if they will consider it, then take take a take a stab at it. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean that you will face rejection. It just means that you're not going to be as competitive as you would have been if you had gotten the preferred ICU experience. So researching this early on, you guys, is really important and not being afraid to make that difficult move. I know it's unfortunate, especially like I, I have a big heart for I'm a peds um, CRNA. I love working with kids and I never had peds experience as a nurse. And I feel really awful when I have my students who are really passionate about being a NICU nurse or a PICU nurse and they find out their program won't accept either one of those experiences and they feel like they have to kind of abandon their passion just to go back to be a CRNA. I do find that unfortunate, but I also know and promise you that if you just make it your goal to become a CRNA, you can snuggle those sweet babies before they drift off to sleep. It can happen. You can make it your long-term goal to go back and work as a PEDS ICU or PEDS uh, CRNA. So keep that in mind. You have to play the long game when pursuing CRNA. And if your school really wants adult ICU experience, that is what you have to give them. So I want to make sure I'm making that very clear to research what type of ICU experience do they consider as their preference and not being afraid to leave your unit to get the experience that they want. The acuity level is another big one too. You know, I mean, I think pa people will ask me, well, what's, what's high acuity? If you see patients being shipped out to other hospitals, follow them to that hospital. Um, if you are barely ever taking vents, barely ever have vasoactive drips, you have to find a unit that will give you those challenges. Do you have advanced life support um, opportunities like like Prisma, for example? Um, you know, do you do ECMO or um, balloon pumps, things like that? Look for ways to get an additional life support um, measures and get certified doing those things. Uh, you know, a lot of students too, maybe they've been out of school for eight, nine years and their science, their core sciences are actually older than 10 years old. That's another thing too, that I think sometimes people don't realize until they get to the application process and they're like, oh my gosh, I have to repeat all these sciences. Oh, that's going to take me so much time. But had they done some research and planning early on, they would have realized this. So over the eight years of being an ICU nurse, maybe the last two or three years, they could have been retouching up some of their science courses and done it over a period of time. And some of these hospitals would even pay for you to go back and get some um, college credits. So taking advantage of that. Um, but again, if you don't know these types of things, it's hard for you to plan for it. And then you're kind of bombarded last minute and you're like, oh, now what? Now I'm, now I'm behind. Now I, I can't even go forward with my application. 
So making sure you understand what your school requires as far as how current do your sciences have to be. And then understanding what sciences they actually require um, and making sure you meet that requirement. Um, the GRE requirement, you know, it kind of goes to like, you know, these schools, you guys don't have to make exceptions. And depending now, some schools are not very sticklers or are not very strict, I should say, with the GRE requirement. Um, if they say 300, some of them will take a 298, for example. Um, but others will say, no, if you don't have, you got a 299, go back and I, I, we won't take your application. You didn't get the 300. That's our requirement. Now, I can't speak every program's different as far as how strict they're going to be with that requirement. But the reality is they, they do not have to make exceptions for your application. They get plenty of qualified candidates every single application cycle. So they just simply do not have to make exceptions. Um, so if that happens to you, make sure you're reaching out to them to understand whether you should be spending time and money uh, reinvesting and taking the GRE or if it's going to allow you to proceed with your application. But I also encourage you, if you don't meet the minimum, they say, yeah, go ahead. You can keep applying. We'll consider your application. What are some other areas that you can maybe be more um, are stronger in to kind of overcome that? So let's just say your GRE, you didn't meet the minimum, but what's your science GPA? Have you taken any graduate level courses? These are ways that you can kind of work around that lower G, uh, GRE score to kind of show, yeah, my quantitative score was just average, but I just got an A in advanced pathophysiology, um, you know, or chemistry or organic chemistry, showing ways that, you know, you know that you can withstand the curriculum in CRNA school because of X, Y, and Z, that it doesn't just come down to the GRE. Um, many schools are recognizing this, but however, it just depends. Some schools are still pretty uh, strict with the GRE requirements. So making sure you're researching that early on. The CCRN, I mentioned that because not all people realize that some schools will look at your or require your CCRN score. And the, the minimum, the most recent minimum that I saw to pass is an 83 out of 125 score questions. That's a 66.4%. <laughs> that's pretty low to pass a CCRN. That's not even a, I mean, a, that's a 70%, I think would be low, but a 66% is what you need to pass that test. And um, most schools will look for a benchmark around 80%, which is about 100 questions out of 125 is what you should be aiming for on your CCRN. Now, that being said, this goes back to preparation, you guys, and having this knowledge prior to going into tests. So many people I see wing the GRE, wing the CCRM because they don't leave enough time to study for it, to plan. They just try to get all their application materials together at once versus playing the long game and spending a whole year preparing and, and working on their application. I truly believe an application process process. So it should start a year out from when the application cycle opens. All right. Um, so that's that's a lot of time. And then on top of that, six to nine months, you need to be before your anticipated interview, you need to be studying and preparing for your interview, which means you'll be doing a lot of these things at the same time. So as you can see, if you don't plan for this in the application and you save it all to the very end, you're not going to be able to put your best foot forward. You're going to be winging the CCRN, winging the GRE, not really preparing as much as you could for the interview because you're not going to have the time. You're working full time. You have other life obligations, right? So give yourself the time, give that gift of time that you need. And this can start a nursing school. I know a lot of the students that get into CRNA school right away have been planning for CRNA school from the time they were senior students in nursing school. So that can be done, and that's how I did it. That's how a lot of people did it. Now, I still took three years, but I was planning for CRNA school when I was a senior nursing student. Um, I had another girlfriend of mine who probably planned for CRNA school from the time she was a sophomore nursing student, and she got in with only six months of ICU experience. So again, she was a very good planner. She planned way ahead and made sure she had all of her ducks in a row before she applied. So um, it can be done. It's just a matter of are you giving yourself enough time to do all the things? Um, but yeah, making sure that you put your best foot forward on the CCRN because some of these schools will require to see your scores. And, you know, if you have an 83 out of 125 and you just barely passed, it might be like, ooh, like that kind of, kind of worrisome, you know, because that's a very heavy science based type of test. Um, also, your personal statement, your resume, you know, how much effort did you put into that? How many proof? proofreading did you do? Did you ask anyone else to proofread it for you? Um, you should be if you have not. And you should have at least four or five different revisions, in my opinion, um, because just writing it one time and thinking it's great. I mean, why don't you rest on it and come back to it and make sure because this is your grad school application and there's a lot of writing in your DMP program. So they want to make sure that you are a good writer. So don't be afraid to get help with that um, to make sure that you put your best foot forward on your essay and on your resume. 
Um, not following the requirements for references. I mean, I have a lot of students who have issues as far as having current managers because maybe they left or maybe they're traveling. You have to follow the requirements. Some schools are, will maybe lenient with, okay, like, but just don't do it without asking. Don't pick an old manager when they ask for a current manager thinking it's going to be okay because if they find out you didn't follow the rules, again, why do they have to make exceptions? They don't. They don't have to make exceptions. So just making sure you're following the rules um, and if you're not sure if there's a circumstance that makes you feel uncomfortable about what you have to do, reach out and ask for guidance. Um, oh, this is a big one. Submitting your application early. This is huge. A lot of schools will give preferences for applicants who submit their resume or resume, their application early um, and give them preferences for first round of interviews. I mean, if you could compete for 20 spots and get in that first round of interviews versus applying at the deadline and only having 10 spots now that you're competing with for the rest of the late applicants, you've just limited your chances by half. Now, obviously, I don't know how, you know, the first round of interviews, I'm not sure if they will have half the seats fold or more than half the seats fold. They could maybe only have five spots left for the late applicants to essentially be competing for. So the earlier you get your application in, when that window opens, the better. But again, this takes planning. This takes uh, being aware of how quickly you need to be asking for references and knowing that that's not going to happen overnight, that a lot of people may need several nudges to get their reference in for you. Um, <clears throat> and then how well prepared are you for the interview? So many students, it doesn't matter how good you look on paper, how amazing your, your application is. You could have the best application on paper. If you go into your interview and you put up some red flags, the answer is going to be no. Nope, sorry. If you make them think that you're not going to fly in clinical, that you're going to be a difficult student to work with over the three years, they're not going to let you into their program. Okay, that's just the bottom line. And another problem I see a lot of students make is they say, well, my parent knows so and so, so I think I'm a shoe in. Don't assume. And also, not necessarily, yes, you might have one person on that panel really rooting for you and really genuinely likes you and thinks you'd be a great candidate, but it's not their decision by themselves. They have to, it's a, it's a panel. All these interview processes are done by panels. It's not just one person saying, yes, I want this person. You guys, I overrule you all. Um, they collectively make this decision. And so they even sometimes ask their current students for feedback. They'll have a mix and mingle session with students. That's like ding, ding, ding. They're probably going to ask some students, hey, what did you think of so-and-so? We're considering letting them into their program. Did they show you any signs of any red flags? And they probably give them some things to look for. But yeah, I mean, it's a collective um, it's a collective decision. So just don't assume, put your best foot forward, prepare for the interview as best you can. And also know that these interviews, you guys, unfortunately, the way it is, is these are gray. They're gray. They're not black and white. It's very subjective. Um, these panels can get fatigued. And yes, they are human too, right? They do the best that they can on the knowledge they have with what makes a successful student in their program. And so they are very good pickers. They've done this time and time again. Um, but they, at the end of the day, they are human as well. So just know that literally every single application cycle, amazing candidates get rejected. Amazing candidates. Or you get waitlisted, right? And a waitlist is an acceptance, but they just don't have room for you. But either way, great candidate candidates, you know, maybe they get their nerves get the best of them or they they blank and they can't speak. I've heard some pretty incredible stories from these program directors who share with me some of these things that candidates say during their interview. And it just goes to show that if you don't prepare, you don't practice and handling your nerves and how you're going to be put in this high pressure situation, you know, you might blow your chance, even if you have a great application. So preparation, preparation is really key practice. It doesn't have to be paid practice. You can practice in front of a mirror. Record yourself. Record it in front of a coworker who doesn't really know you that well, but you know would be supportive of your CRNA dreams and let them give you feedback, right? That way you're nervous because you don't know them that well, but you know they're not going to be, you know, they're going to be supportive of you. Put yourself in an uncomfortable position and challenge yourself to be in that position and practice that. Um, so yes, I, again, think you should be practicing for your interview about six to nine months out. I think you should be planning on your application about a year away from when the application cycle opens. Um, and I also want to leave you guys with this, that, you know, just adopt the mindset that no, not yet. And no doesn't mean never because you have to persevere. This is going to be challenging. And if you get accepted on the first try, high five. So excited for you. Congratulations. But if you don't, it doesn't mean never, right? I was not accepted the first time. 
I'm okay with that. It's all good. I use it as a learning experience, right? And yes, it felt icky and yes, it hurt, but I, I moved on. I carried on. I kept, I said, you know what? I'm just going to have to show up until I figure this out, right? I'm going to figure it out. I, that's my, my big thing all the time is I'm going to figure this out. <laughs> Even if it's painful, I'm going to figure it out. So you can do it. Believe in yourself. I know you can do it. I hope to see you inside the Academy because I would love to cheer you on and share your success and just celebrate with you. Um, but I'm really thankful you tuned to our podcast every week. So thank you so much. Please remember to leave a review and make sure you subscribe and I will see you next week. Have a good rest of your day.